Celebrating 45 years on the air, award-winning Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, believe it or not, the next farm bill right around the corner. The NRCS already on the hot seat. Plus, that didn't take long, weather already a major force across much of the nation. In Southern Gardening, Gary has the DIY on taking your landscape to heart with a Valentine's project. And in our feature, Aquaculture, one family's all-American dream. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everybody, I'm Mike Russell. Thanks for joining us once again here on Farm Week. Not long ago, we were talking about the 2018 Farm Bill. Now the Farm Bill is on the radar again. And as part of that prep, Congress curious about conservation. Peter Tubbs examines the arduous task of moving the 2023 Farm Bill along. The House Ag Committee began the long the process of writing the 2023 Johnson Farm Bill with a hearing about the conservation projects the USDA administers according to the 2018 Farm Bill. Farmer access to services during COVID-19 driven closures were a primary concern of committee members. What is the staffing capacity level that you need to effectively implement the Farm Bill conservation programs and to provide needed technical assistance? You know, we, we have a very aggressive hiring strategy. Last year, also, we had direct hire authority where we were able to um, take resumes and bring on a very capable staff to NRCS. Over the last two years, we've hired about 3,000 employees, and over the next two years, um, hopefully we'll be able to bring on the same. We are well above our attrition rate. Uh, as people leave the agency for retirement, uh, we've been able to maintain our numbers. We're at 10,300 right now. Our, our, our number is a little over 11,000 that we can staff up to, and we're going to make that number this year. Would you comment on anything you're already doing or considering within USDA to improve accessibility to NRCS programs? I'm a son of a farmer from Mississippi. And in the 70s, my dad had to give up farming operations because of being denied services that he needed to keep the operation flowing. And it was a sad day for my family to give up the farming operation. I would tell you that it's something that I get up every morning, I work hard on, not only conservation, but making sure that every person in this country that wants to benefit from USDA program has that opportunity. In other news, an extended version of a story we brought you a few weeks ago, improving aging locks and dams along the Mississippi River. That will cost billions. There is a precedent for moving private money being used to move projects like this along. John Torpy has more. Several farm organizations are working to help jumpstart infrastructure projects along the nation's busiest inland waterway. In an effort to promote improvements to lock and dams along the Mississippi River, the United Soybean Board, the Soy Transportation Coalition, and multiple state soybean associations offered $1 million to offset pre-construction costs at the aging lock and dam 25 at Winfield, Missouri. The farmer-funded organizations want to get several of the proposed Army Corps of Engineers construction projects along the Mississippi River moving forward. Many of the same agricultural organizations, as well as several inland maritime fleets, have been sounding the alarm for decades about what they see as dilapidated conditions at aging lock and dam facilities along the nation's busiest inland water superhighway. Built in 1939, the 600-foot lock and dam 25 helps move almost every bushel of harvested grains from the Midwest to shipping facilities in Louisiana. 30 years past its expected lifespan, the St. Louis District Lock and Dam will be the first of five revitalization projects identified by the Navigation and Ecosystem Sustainability Program, or NESP. If approved, the plan would expand the length of the lock to 1,200 feet, more than double the efficiency of the facility, and allow for moving unbroken 15 barge tows downriver. Currently, most existing locks require the same load to be broken in half, which increases the lock through time from 30 minutes to two hours. The United Soybean Board successfully made a similar monetary move on the lower Mississippi River. 
The organization raised $2 million to help kickstart a dredging project in Louisiana, deepening the channel for ships hauling commodities to overseas markets. As you might expect, weather an issue over the last few weeks as a series of storms moved across the country. Wind, rain, ice and snow all part of the picture. Dave Miller takes a closer look. A winter storm blasted across the nation, striking the mountains, racing through the south and sweeping up the coast to the northeast. Hundreds of thousands in the storm's path have been left without power as the hardest hit regions dig out from under the snow and ice. Major airlines have canceled more than 7,000 flights in areas leading in and out of the storm's path. More than 20 inches of snow dumped on the slopes of the Rockies in Colorado. As the storm moved east, it put more than a foot on the ground in Illinois, Indiana, and Michigan. In Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Texas, along the southern edge of the storm, residents dealt with freezing rain that coated streets, trees, and buildings. We are dealing with one of the most significant icing events that we've had in the state of Texas uh, in at least several decades. The power grid in Texas, which suffered a major outage under similar conditions almost a year ago, appears to be holding its own. There have been a few exceptions where power lines snapped under the weight of the accumulating ice, leaving 70,000 without power. The recent snow and sleet events across the country were not included in this week's drought monitor, but last week's winter storms helped mitigate some areas of severe and extreme drought. Despite the additional moisture, there are still concerns over the final effect of reduced mountain snowpack and increased dryness across the plains. A couple of Newswire stories to report on first, and we'll have a feature related to this next week. With an increased focus on local sources for food in urban areas, the USDA has announced a 12-member Federal Advisory Committee on Urban Agriculture. That committee will provide input on policy and work to promote urban farming. The committee will meet for the first time later this month. The members come from Ag, Higher Education, Extension, uh, extension Economic Development, Supply Chain Management, and Finance. And one other story we'll be following, and this is a move that, in our opinion, could backfire. The DOJ has launched an online tool that allows farmers and ranchers to anonymously report what they consider to be anti-competitive practices. The tool at FarmerFairness.gov was ostensibly launched to make markets more competitive, but the anonymous nature of the system could be problematic. It's a story we'll definitely follow. Valentine's Day just around the corner in Southern Gardening. Gary Bachman taking things to heart with a fun gardening activity even in the middle of February. Here's Gary. Handmade Valentine's gifts are always appreciated and here's a great idea for that special gardener, a DIY herb garden kit. An herb garden kit is a practical gift to give and your local garden center will have all the components for the kit. Let's get started. I've chosen this cute little crate to hold the herb kit components. I've selected a variety of herb seeds that are easy to grow indoors. Because herb seed are small, many are pelletized for easier sowing. The seeds need growing mix and I love these peat pellets. Place a pellet into a peat pot, add water, and watch the pellet expand. Drop in two to three seeds and place the pot in a windowsill. As for herbs, dill is a popular choice with its frilly fine textured foliage. This is a forgiving herb that is a popular choice for fish dishes, and the flower heads are used for homegrown dill pickles. Sage is a coarse leaf perennial herb. The common variety has aromatic grayish green leaves. Basil is a fast growing annual herb that's a good choice. Sweet Italian is a great pick for Valentines that love pesto. Thyme has aromatic gray green leaves that are wonderful with poultry dishes and an essential part of herb bundles called bouquet garni. And rosemary, a Mississippi medallion winner, has needle-like foliage and a warm and tangy flavor. Add a red-themed plant, and of course some candy, 
and it's ready for your gardening valentine. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. We'll take a short break, but coming up on Farm Week, we're headed down to the Gulf. You think New Orleans, you think seafood, right? That's where you'll find this family, experts in aquaculture over the years and this shrimping business big time. In an industry that's competitive in every way, like land-based farmers, they're out early in the morning, bringing home the day's catch, still competing against foreign companies, still pursuing that American dream after half a century. Forrest Gump would be proud. We're in Nolens, coming up on Farm Week. Don't go away. I believe in people and their hopes, their aspirations and their faith, and their right to make their own plans and arrive at their own decisions, and their ability and power to enlarge their lives and plan for the happiness of those they love. I believe that education, of which extension work is an essential part, is basic in stimulating individual initiative, self-determination, and leadership that these are the keys to democracy, and that people, when given facts they understand, will act not only in their self-interest, but also in the interest of society. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. I believe in people and their hopes, their aspirations, and their faith. I believe in intellectual freedom to search for and present the truth without bias and with courteous tolerance toward the views of others. I believe that education is a lifelong process and the greatest university is the home. That my success as a teacher is proportional to those qualities of mind and spirit that give me welcome entrance to the homes of the families I serve. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. Time for the Market Report. Zach has a packed segment today. Zach? Absolutely, Mike. Markets continuing to rise. The only losses last week were corn and wheat. Lumber seeing an upward trend alongside livestock, so let's take a look. Last week's biggest loss, wheat down 23 cents, followed by corn at 15 and a half. We'll get into why in a moment. Last week's biggest gain, soybeans at 83 and a half cents, followed by lumber at $45. On beans, the rise seems to be coming from market speculation based on bad weather from South America hindering their crop. So, corn and wheat down. Why? Well, the reasons might be more complicated than you think. As we know, markets flux on informed speculation, but the fly in the ointment can come from unexpected places. In this instance, international politics. Market analyst Mark Gold explains. I, maybe the biggest part of it, though, has been the stalemate on the Russian-Ukrainian border. Now, are they going to move in? Nobody knows. What's interesting is that Putin was at the VIP box with President Xi of China at the opening of the Olympics this morning. Rumor has it that they were putting together a new deal on exporting uh, some products to China and, you know, signing some kind of trade deal. Uh, it may have been a cover for Putin to get Xi's permission or blessing to go into Ukraine uh, during the Olympics. I don't think he'd make that kind of a move without talking to him first. So nobody knows what the real message was. But, you know, we rebounded. We broke 90 cents. We rebounded here in the last couple of days. Uh, we've been pretty oversold. Certainly, if, if Putin moves on Ukraine, we'll see a spike, I think, in all the grains. Um, is it going to last long? Is it going to be more than a, you know, a 10 minute blip on a chart? I don't know. But I think the pros will be willing sellers on a good rally. Yeah, it's been a little bit of a mixed bag. I think the biggest news was China canceling that sale yesterday. That took a lot of people by surprise. The rumors have been consistently that after the Lunar New Year is up on Monday, that the Chinese are going to be buying corn and beans. Now, if they're going to be buying corn, why would they cancel a sale? 
doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Some people are starting to doubt whether the Chinese buying is going to be that significant. Uh, we've got the Chinese $13 billion shy of what they needed to accomplish on the phase one deal. There is phase two, I guess, uh, talks in place right now. Are they going to let them slide on that $13 billion and tack it onto the next program? I don't know. But, you know, this corn's still a pretty high price here. It's been a nice move. Hasn't backed off. And a lot of people think that exports over the next couple of months, just we, nobody's going to have enough corn. So that's what every time we see these breaks in the market, the market has a tendency to come right back. Last week, we talked about the latest USDA report on cattle numbers and how they could have an effect on markets moving forward. Well, based on a rise in live cattle prices, that seems to be true. However, there's more going on, and I sat down with livestock economist Josh Maples to find out. The annual cattle report was released recently. Uh, what are the major takeaways from that report? So my biggest takeaway, Zach, is continued liquidation. I really think that's the theme that this report tells us, especially compare when you put it together with the past couple of reports. Beef cow number down about 2.3% nationally. Uh, if you look at the number of heifers retained, which tells us a little bit about what maybe to expect this year, that number was down by more than 3% nationally. So that tells us that those heifers last year that weren't retained are not going to be cows this year. So we might even see a little bit more liquidation as we go. It's difficult to think about it a little bit because that 2.3% was down compared to 2021 numbers. That number was also revised down in this report. So it was down compared to a number that was also revised lower. Probably the easiest way to think about this is if we think back to if we compare it back to 2019, which was our last peak in the beef cow numbers, we're off about a million and a half hit. So we're down about 5% from where we were just a couple of years ago in terms of total number of beef cows that are gonna produce those calves. Well, what do the lower number of cows in the report suggest about future production? So that's the big thing. So the last couple of years, we've had really large uh, cattle on feed numbers, have had a lot of cattle out there. Uh, Tighter cow supplies eventually mean tighter calf and feeder cattle and fed cattle supplies. So we're going to have fewer calves hit the ground this year than we did last year. We had fewer calves on the ground last year than the year before that. That means not as many cattle, you know, coming out off of cow-calf operations. There's a time lag in there because of the longer production cycle, but that'll eventually mean fewer stalker cattle. It'll, it'll mean fewer cattle going into feedlots. It'll mean fewer cattle. Uh, coming out of feedlots as we move through 2022 and into 2023. So tighter supplies throughout the system. Well, this report included state level estimates. Uh, what did the Mississippi numbers tell us? So if we look at Mississippi, this report gives us the most detailed inventory data that we'll get all year. You know, we get it at the first of the year and, and that's really what we work off of uh, in terms of inventory numbers until we get the mid-year report, which isn't quite as detailed. but. State level Mississippi beef cows estimated at 478,000 head. Uh, this was down less than 1% compared to a year ago. So uh, I'd call it relatively unchanged com compared to where we were a year ago. If we look at that heifer number though, uh, the number of heifers in Mississippi retained last year uh, was down about 4% from the previous year. So producers, the report would suggest that producers in Mississippi didn't retain as many heifers that would ultimately become cows uh, this year. So, so some tighter supplies in Mississippi as well. Well, uh, summing this all up, how does this new information adjust the outlook for 2022? I think it's very optimistic. I mean, this is the most optimistic price outlook uh, that we've seen in years. You know, in, in futures markets are, are currently showing that. If you look at what feeder cattle futures prices, live cattle futures prices are, are trading at right now, uh, really high levels. I mean, we're at the highest levels that we've seen since 2015. Uh, so this is going to be an optimistic price year. You know, some some strong prices, uh, beef beef demand both domestically and, interna and internationally uh, has been strong, and we're getting to a point where inventories will be uh, back more in line with capacity. So I think you know cattle producers are are, are in a price wise are in a good spot in terms of what we're expecting prices to do this year as the as inventories do tighten up. And that's it for a deeper look into the markets. Things seem encouraging. We're slowly inching away from COVID, but international issues could turn that around. Mike. Thank you, Zach. Always good to end on an up note. For the last couple of weeks, we've been telling you about this piece, a family living the all-American dream in aquaculture. 
Of course, America does compete with companies overseas, and that, combined with tough environmental laws, makes it harder for American companies to succeed. But sometimes those odds just don't matter. Here's Delaney Howell from our news partner, Market to Market, with the story. The business of seafood can be treacherous, with many variables challenging producers. For one Louisiana seafood company, success has been measured by a pickup truck and one firm handshake at a time. After a mission trip in the late 1980s, Tommy DeLon moved back to Louisiana with his new wife. He decided to start a family and a new career in New Orleans. They just pursued the American dream and started building their business with a pickup truck, working early mornings, driving down to the docks, two, three, four o'clock every morning, getting the day's fresh catch and then bringing it right back to the city to sell to all of the best restaurants in the quarter. In the years that followed their pursuit of the American dream, the DeLons would expand what is now Tommy's Seafood. They brought their children into the mix and in the early 1990s started to vertically integrate. We have control over, uh, of course, over the catch from the moment that it's unloaded all the way to the final packaging uh, at the last stage before it makes it to the consumer. So we, uh, our fishermen that we work with, they harvest the seafood for us, we unload it, we send it to our other facilities, we process it, we package it, uh, we store it, we ship it, and it's ready for the rest of the world to enjoy. Tommy's Seafood sells several types of shrimp, oysters, and blue crab. But the company's seafood mix is only part of their success. One way the DeLons are trying to sustain their family operation is to rely on the tools used decades ago when the business was taking its first steps. Growing up in St. Bernard Parish allowed me to be able to cultivate all of these longstanding relationships that, uh, that, that my family had or that I was able to make along the way with other families who have uh, multi-generational fishing in their blood. So uh, it is without a doubt one of the reasons why we're able to be so successful in this business. Of the 3.6 billion pounds of seafood landed in the contiguous 48 states, more than 1 million of that total comes ashore in Louisiana. In 1990, the U.S. shrimp catch was just over 18 million pounds, with an estimated value of $75 million. Almost three decades later, the 2018 harvest was 40% smaller at around 11 million pounds, and the final tally cut nearly in half to come in at just over $40 million. You know, we face not just competition here domestically, eh, although it's friendly competition, but we face a lot of competition overseas. So we consume about a billion pounds of shrimp here in the United States each year, and 90% of that comes from overseas, and that's 90% and counting. So you know, their objective is to completely eliminate the domestic industry. We're without a doubt the underdogs in this business. The Pelican State's seafood industry recently received some help from Louisiana legislature and Governor John Bell Edwards. Last month, a new law was passed requiring food establishments to notify customers when the seafood they are being served is from a foreign source. The measure was introduced to put local commercial fishermen into the spotlight and help boost small town economies along Louisiana's coast. Besides weathering the storm of ever-changing markets with overseas competitors, Tommy's Seafood has to navigate through an ecosystem that can force changes to their product line in a flash. Prior to Hurricane Katrina in 2005, the industry, the waters, the marshlands, they were a lot different than what they were today. So we started seeing a whole lot more crabs show up in this area and a whole lot less shrimp. So that was another reason why we changed our tactics of just putting all of our focus on shrimp and diversifying more into crabs. Now we unload more crabs at our dock than we do shrimp. Prior to Hurricane Katrina, it used to be the other way around. So, uh, you know, we're just finding ways to, to be creative and to make sure that we can still sustain ourselves. Those long-standing relationships are the backbone of their operation. 
Over the past five decades, the Dewans have expanded their reach across the Pacific to markets in Asia. They are hopeful their reputation will help them move across the Atlantic as they begin researching market opportunities in the European Union. The Delons have no plans to stop building on their successes and will continue to stick to the family's main principles of quality product, reliable delivery, and making a deal one handshake at a time. Our Louisiana slogan, the official state motto is feed your soul. Right, and so I think that they go hand in hand with one another. When you think Louisiana, you think seafood, you think food, you think culture, and it's just a, a big medley of awesomeness down here. Always good to see that American dream in action, especially these days. Tommy's Seafood's plant in New Orleans is 30,000 feet big, and if you'd like to know more, visit their website at wildamericanseafood.com. Well, next week, you might call it Boot Camp for Do-It-Yourself Growing, a year-long program in Connecticut that teaches would-be urban farmers how to grow produce and sell it at their local farmers markets. It's an intensive program, and it caters to those who want to feed their families and maybe sell what they grow to their neighbors. That's next time on Farm Week. Remember, if you missed a story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube as well. See you next week. Thanks for watching.